Greetings, everybody, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. Before you all ask, I wanted to go back to the being off camera introduction and putting things back the way it was. If you are new here or you have been here already and you enjoy what you are hearing, please don't forget to subscribe and set your bell notification to all. That way you won't miss any of the stories that I upload. Also, if you enjoy what you're hearing, you can buy me a coffee. All of that information can be found down below. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Backwoods Creepy Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes only. It was late August of 2011. I was 11 at the time and I was staying at my dad's house for the weekend. My dad is a very outdoorsy man. He likes nature and makes us go on long hikes. We live directly opposite of a wood, so every now and again, me and my brother and my dad would take our three dogs there, Reddington, Effie, and Rip. This was summer holiday time, so I could stay up to whatever time I wanted, and my dad took advantage of that. He liked going out on late night walks with the dogs most of the time, especially on his own, but sometimes with my brother. I was 11, as I said before, so I still believed hugely in ghosts and the paranormal. So every time he'd ask me to go on these walks, I'd stare away because I was scared of going into the woods late at night. The time I finally plucked up the courage to go, my dad was more than happy. We went out the door and we started talking. We had just entered the woods when we heard a whistle. I said, do you hear that? He said he did. He said not to worry, but his face said otherwise. At that point, I was terrified. I tried to make him go home, but he is a very stubborn man. We were maybe about 30 minutes into the walk when we saw a man sitting on one of the benches near the park. He looked old, maybe late 60s, white hair, burgundy suit, a dark wood cane, and a drink of something. When we passed him, we each said our hellos, but he was dead silent, his eyes wide open, and a pale face scared the living shit out of me. We picked up the pace, but then we heard the whistle again. It was louder this time. He moved closer, sitting on a bench nearer to us. I told my dad, we need to turn around and go back. I don't remember much after that because I pushed away the memories all these years. But as soon as we were walking, we saw a poster on a pole. I was always curious as a kid, nosy, etc. So I read it. Martin Jones, age 67, height 5'5", five five, gone missing at around 10 p.m. Saturday, July 9th. It was the same man I beckoned my dad over, but he stopped, eyes wide open, and shouted, Get away from my son! I turned around, and there he was, just about to grab me when my dad came over and pushed him away as we ran, calling the authorities. But they said they've never heard of the man, and at that point, we never went into that woods again. This is something that happened to I and a friend as kids, and is more of a disturbing discovery than a disturbing person. We were probably somewhere between 11 and 14 at the time, and it was the middle of the summer. It was also something I didn't really come to understand until much later in life, when there was no way to resolve what he and I had seen. My house was in a valley. There were a few houses along the street with it, 
but the hills on the other side were underdeveloped, forest back then. Me and my friend would hike up the hill behind the house, through a few miles of woods and out the other side where there was another neighborhood that had a farm stand style shop with local honey and a bunch of cheap candy. We also just hung out in the woods a lot and would tell each other scary stories as we headed back home. None of them were all that scary looking back on the ones I can remember, but younger me was always a little spooked on the way back to the house. One dusk, while we were heading back for the day, I spotted a bit of a white in a mound of moss. As a kid, I was always looking for interesting stuff to take home and collect, so I was immediately ready to go dig it out of the moss. When I did, I found it was a pelvis bone. It had probably been there for a long time. I remember it was pockmarked and dirty, worn away slightly from time. I was pretty scared for a second, but I remembered that all sorts of animals have pelvis bone and that this one must be from a deer or something. In my childish need to be a know-it-all and jumping at my first non-frightening possibility, I told my friend it was a deer pelvis. We marveled at it for a bit, but put it back because I knew my dad would be mad if we brought back an old deer bone. I forgot about it for a long time. Many, many years went by, but eventually, I learned more about the shape of human bones as opposed to animals. I remember the shape I found quite clearly. It was almost certainly a human bone, and the size wouldn't have been an adult. I wonder what else was in that mound, who it might have been, and if my finding it could have given someone somewhere some closure. I went back and looked for it twice, thinking I might remember the part of the woods it had been in, but I never found it again. I have had the misfortune of coming across a few scary guys in my life. My friends will say I'm a weirdo magnet, so I'm pretty wary and clued up now I'm a bit older, but when I was a teenager, I suppose you could say I was very naive. Back then I was 20 me, and my family, my mom and little sister, had moved from a small rural village in the Shires to the town down south. It was a huge change, and as I had been having a difficult time, I welcomed the change of scenery. It was a beautiful town in an affluent part of the country, but I struggled to find a job and became very frustrated as my mom needed a bit of help with money. Over the course of about three months, we became fairly friendly with the middle-aged guy who owned a takeaway shop in town. I will just call him Phil for the story. If ever he saw us doing some shopping, he would come and chat and ask how the family was doing, and he genuinely seemed like a decent, caring bloke. So, when he said he might have a job for me in his shop with a small flat upstairs I could rent for next to nothing, I thought, okay, great, maybe things are looking up. Phil got our address and told me and Mom he would pop by early evening time when he had finished and take me in the car to go and see the flat. I get myself looking fairly casual but presentable and I'm feeling excited and confident, thinking, wow, a job and a flat. I've killed two birds with one stone here. I just need to show him I'm sophisticated and would make a great employee. Around 8 p.m., he knocks on the front door and mom answers. He tells her he will probably only be about half an hour and he will have me back safe and sound in no time. Now, I didn't take my phone with me as I had no credit to call out and didn't think I would be needing it for a quick trip up the road and back. In hindsight, a pretty stupid thing to do. Maybe if I had my phone on me, this would have deterred him from what he was about to do. 
It's already dark out, as it is March. I get into his car, and we start driving. And he is chatting away, asking how I am, and telling me what the flat looks like, when within a matter of a few minutes, I've noticed that we are not taking the conventional route that takes us directly into town. At first, I think he is taking me down some sort of shortcut around the town to get to it, and just reason with myself that he knows the area well and I don't. 30 seconds after I realize he is taking me in the completely opposite direction, and I can tell that we are driving away from the populated town and into an area where trees swamp both sides of the road. My brain is now working overtime thinking, where the fuck is this guy taking me? And I just about manage to keep my composure and ask him outright, uh, <laughs> um, where are we going? <laughs> Town's back the other way. <sighs> just thought I would take you on a little detour. It's beautiful here. Many forests and peaceful places. I would love to show you. He tells me in his normal cheery tone. I wasn't capable of saying anything at that moment because the logical and the reasoning sides of my brain were in full-blown war. I'm trying to keep calm, thinking, okay, he seems fairly normal. Why wouldn't he want to show me an area? It is a stunning area full of natural beauty. He is probably proud to show me where he lives. The logical side, however, disagreed, and a wave of panic comes over me, and a little voice enters my head and shouts, What? In the dark? Shit, no. Are you stupid? So I just sit there in silence, taking in the scenery, which is becoming more sinister by the second, because at that moment in time, I didn't know what to think. All I know is every cell in my body is screaming at me to find a way out of this situation. I started looking for signposts, houses, distinctive landmarks, ditches, huge trees, anything that would be able to use to recognize my way back if I had to bolt from his car. Phil can obviously sense I'm nervous, so he is just talking away at me about what the job is like and how his staff are friendly, and before I know it, he has slowed down to a crawl, and he has turned down a little mud red road with a dense tree line on one side and pitch black open fields on the other. My stomach literally drops, and my body contemplates power vomiting all over his car because the reality of what is about to potentially happen hits me like a freight train. I'm thinking to myself, if I jump out here, I have to be able to run over muddy fields into literally nowhere, but my imagination starts rather helpfully flashing my images of him grabbing me before I can get a chance to get out of the door. So I just sit there buckled in the passenger seat, not saying a word. I'm just thinking to myself, if he attacks me, don't make a sound. Don't give him the satisfaction of showing him I'm scared. My brain was about as useful as a chocolate teapot, and I was starting to get angry with myself for not doing something, but I was terrified. We come out at the top of this little dirt road, and there is a little tiny car park surrounded by woodland with one car sat in it. It was clear there were people in there having sex, and as he pulls near the car, I realize he has brought me to a local dogging spot. He turns to me and puts his hand on my knee. We should do what they're doing. With a deadly serious expression on his face, I make this bizarre half-nervous laugh, half-garbled high-pitched whine, and try to laugh off the suggestion to show him I'm not into it and I'm super uncomfortable right now. The alarmed expression on his face at my gurgled cackle, which sounds like I've swallowed a potato whole, clearly freaks him out, and I'm mentally congratulating myself for my socially awkward and grossly unsexy reaction. It'll be fun. No one will see us, he persists. Uh, no, I don't want to, plus... 
I'm kind of seeing someone right now. I lie. But he sits there, just smiling at me like a Cheshire cat. Like I'm going to miraculously change my mind at the sight of his weird face. Mom will be expecting me home now, I tell him, after an insanely uncomfortable 30 seconds. More of this as I try my damned hardest not to make eye contact. I'm sure she won't mind you being out a little bit longer with me. You can trust me, you know. He tells me with a straight face as we sit next to the sex wagon parked right to us. I sharply pull my leg away from his grip and I tell him again. Mom is waiting for me. She, she will start panicking if I'm not home in the next few minutes. Now, please take me home. I look him straight in the face and he knows that I'm not messing around. Okay, that's fine. I'll take you back now. With another word, he drives me out of that creepy, seedy place and back home. My finger is hovering over the seatbelt buckle, ready to jump out. As we pull up outside my house, I breathe a sigh of relief as I can see my safety literally a few feet away from me. And before he can stop me, I'm out and slam the door behind me. As I'm stepping over a tiny little rope fence around our garden, he gets out of his car and my heart sinks. I, <laughs> I think I'll pop in and see your mom quickly, he tells me, and I swear I can see a smirk on his face, but I know he is only doing this because he is freaking out, knowing damn well I'm going to tell her. He was trying to delay the inevitable or scare me into keeping my mouth shut. Before I can try and talk him out of it, Mom has heard us pull up and open the front door. I barge past her with one thought on my mind. I head straight into the kitchen, grab the small knife out of the drawer, and fly into my little sister's room like a mad woman. Don't you dare fucking leave this room, no matter what you hear. I whisper to her. Seeing the knife, I am stuffing up my sleeve. She just looks at me with panic in her eyes and whispers back, Okay. I walk back into the living room and the cheeky twat is set on one of the sofas, sprawled out, comfortable as fuck like he is at home. I see red. I swear to God, I felt like the Hulk. I'm ready for this bastard. I awkwardly perch myself on the arm of the sofa Mom is sitting on, the absolute furthest away from him I could manage. As he just sits there making small talk with Mom about how is she finding the area, are the neighbors friendly, all the while keeping his beady little weasel eyes on my every move. Why don't you come over and sit here next to me? He pats the sofa cushion next to him. Uh, no, I'm all right here, thanks, I tell him, as I'm fidgeting with my sleeve trying to stop the little knife from falling out in front of him. Why are you set over there? Come, come here honestly, I won't bite. <laughs> he laughs and pats the seat next to him again. No, I'm quite comfortable here. Thank you very much. This time through gritted teeth. My mom, bless her heart, is looking at each of us during this back and forth like a tennis match and I can see something is registering in her eyes. She can see my behavior is all off. I've got one bum cheek weirdly perched on the sofa arm so I'm half stood, half sat down and I'm fiddling about with my sleeve. I'm twitchy as hell and staring my mom in the face intensely, mentally trying to speak to her through the power of telepathy alone. I must have looked like a nutter. <laughs> well, uh, it's getting late now, so I think you should go. She finally speaks. Mom is starting to look anxious now, as she had finally twigged that something has happened. Phil gets up, agrees, and mumbles something about having to check something at his shop. When he walks by me and is nearly out of the room, when he pauses and turns to me and puts out his hand to shake mine, I'm thinking to myself, what a fucking weird thing to do. 
I take the opportunity to kindly offer him my hand that had the knife. Taking it with a bit more force than as polite, he soon yanked his grubby mitt out of mine when he felt the tip of the blade had jabbed him. He looked down and saw the blade, then he looked at me. I looked at him with such disgust. Phil hightailed it out of our home, so fast without another word. A prick for a prick. I told mom everything. She was fuming. We did discuss going to the police, but there wasn't really a crime committed on his part aside from being a major creep. Sadly, when I mentioned to a couple of girls my age who lived down the street, they clammed up and shot each other a strange look. I guessed he had probably done this type of thing before. We moved away from that area after that. I was so glad to report. I never have to see his smug face ever again. This was the most single most terrifying in my life that I have ever been in. And yes, I have been to Iraq and Afghanistan. So I'm sorry if my storytelling skills suck. It's just something that has always stuck with me. I have a cousin that lives in a secluded area where everyone owns land. He has something like 600 acres of land where he lets his cattle run free. I went to visit him one summer and he came up with the idea of camping out. He has a little spot where there is a teepee in a clearing underneath a few large trees. The walking path goes straight through the clearing, down to a little trail to a pond, then goes back up into some trees. To get to this place, we drove his truck through his pasture and up to a tree line. We had to go out and walk a ways into the trees to get there. Thinking back on it, I can't really remember how far into the tree line his camping site was, but it was a little bit of a walk. So it's my cousin, his girlfriend, a friend she brought, and myself. We start to drink and had a small campfire going. Someone threw a little too much brush on the fire and it got pretty big, to the point that it lit some of the branches of the trees above on fire. It was kind of scary at the moment, thinking we almost started a huge fire, but it grew and died pretty quickly. Now, later on in the night, we were all drinking and I'm tending to the fire. The girlfriend says out loud that she needs to use the restroom and I thought that she went down to the path near the pond. The fire is starting to die down and I need to gather some more brush so I start walking towards the path to the pond. As I'm walking down the path, I see a shadow of someone holding a tree branch up, seemingly looking back at me Remembering that the girlfriend had announced that she needed to use the restroom, I assume it was her, so I call out her name. As soon as I do, the shadow drops the tree branch, and I can no longer see it. At that moment, I hear the girlfriend shout back at me from the campsite. I look back, and from a distance, I can see her coming out of the teepee. I look back at the brush, and I see nothing. I stare for a moment, but there was no movement. Completely shocked and confused, I start to walk back to camp, heart already racing so fast I thought I might pass out. When I walk up to the camp, I see that all of us are there. I tell them what just happened, and everyone is a little freaked out. My cousin brushes it off, saying we're out on this land and there's no way anyone could be out here. We eventually kept on drinking, but I cannot forget about it. Much later on, I'm getting a little tired and my cousin is looking to fool around with his girl, so we all lay down in the teepee. I am laying next to the friend, just trying to pass out while I can hear them fooling around. They are talking and whispering when I hear the running thud of footsteps outside of the tent as if somebody is running at the tent. 
Then hear kind of a pop and drag like something hit the tent and drug against it. My cousin leaps up yelling and now we are all terrified. He is shouting that we need to get out of there right now. And we all left everything and ran to its truck. We drove back to the house scared shitless talking about what had just happened and what I saw earlier. As we were all talking about it, we all agreed that the thuds sounded like it had two feet, as you can hear the difference in a deer or horse galloping. They were all big thuds, as if it was carrying a lot of weight. My cousin said he was laying near the edge of the teepee when he heard the steps and looked up to see something hit and drag something across the fabric right above him. The fact that he actually was scared is what made it even more frightening to us as he lived on that land his whole life and had been to that campsite so many times before. Needless to say, it would take us a few years to finally go back and camp at that spot. My dad spent 10 years logging in old growth forests in the specific Northwest. His own personal scary experiences amount to leaning up against a tree, taking a break, when a mountain lion sauntered into view. My dad waved his hand and said, hey cat, and it froze, then tore off into the brush. But. A logger friend was driving home through the logging roads one night, very late with his buddy, when all of a sudden a light enveloped them and shook their whole truck. They pulled off the side of the road as far as they could and waited, scared to death, but it was gone and they never saw it again. Another logging friend was fishing with another guy deep in the forest by a river after a fresh rain. There are lots of little sand banks in the river where stands of small trees and grass grow up on them. They waded into the river and onto the sand bank when the rain started up again. Just then, the first guy stopped in his tracks and stared, called his friend over. There was a fresh, giant footprint in the sand, larger than any of their size 14 or so feet twice over being erased as they looked at it in the rain. It had to have been made in the 15 minutes or so between the rain showers. My dad was engaged for a while to an Indian woman. She remembers being a little girl and her grandmother showing her where X, whatever the native word for Sasquatch is, had gone up the hillside. Something had tore its way up the hill tearing young trees and plants aside viciously. The wreckage was huge. My stepsister's uncle was a hunter like so many others in Washington State. He gave me my first guitar and has passed away now. He chose a time when we were camping and my back was to the forest to tell us about one time when he was hunting. He came to a tree break where a natural meadow was formed in the mountains. He decided to crouch on the edge for a moment and use his binoculars to scan the far tree line. Just then, a foul stench hit him in the face. He lowered the binoculars and shook his head to clear the smell. Then, out in the middle of the meadow, a shape began to take focus as it stood up on two legs. Bear, he thought. He raised up the binoculars to see the backside of something very, very large, making its way quickly out of the meadow on two legs, stinking up the whole place. I shudder, still thinking of that. My mom grew up way out in the Olympic National Forest with four younger sisters. One night, they were driving home through the woods when their engine began sputtering and dying. My mom, who was driving, got it going again, and they stopped at a gas station to call her parents to tell them they were having some car problems. 
They all got out in the gas station and were astonished when the car turned on behind them with no one in it. I have no idea why they got back in after that, but I'm guessing their house wasn't too far away. My mom looked in the rearview mirror and saw what she can describe as a football-shaped object all lit around the borders by beam light following them at treetop level. All four of her sisters saw it too. When they finally turned on the road, it was lost to sight amongst the trees. On top of that, they heard from around the town that other people's engines were having problems that same night. My mom and my aunt are the least imaginative people I know. There is no one less likely to seeing things or make up stories. Another time when my mom was a teenager, she had two roommates, and their local church asked them if a woman who had come into town to stay the night with them, and they agreed. In the middle of the night, they heard strange low rumbling coming from the bathroom. The way my mom remembers it, they peeked into the bathroom, and the woman was inside chanting, and a demonic face was peering back from the mirror. They booked it into the bedroom and were so scared, they opened the window and piled out and over to a neighbor's. Again, not the kind of people who make things up. Myself as a teenager with my cousin, we were sitting in a hot tub in Eastern Washington, looking up into the night sky, when all of a sudden, a bright green arc spread across the sky. Off center was a giant green blob. We were frozen in fear staring. I was ready to bolt inside the house, but my cousin wanted to stay and see what it was. Then it blinked at us and moved in a zigzag pattern. That was enough for me, and I leapt out and ran into the house, babbling to my aunts about lights in the sky. My one aunt said, Oh, she reads too much. Thanks, Aunt Linda. But my cousin, who saw it with me, has an impeccable record and backed me up. Apparently, though, many strange things have been seen in the sky in East Wenatchee. The last thing that happened to me was in Wenatchee too. Years later at my aunt's house, which is right next to a cemetery on one side, a really big apple orchard on the second, hills on the third, and the subdivision on the last. It was winter and the orchard was filled with snow. My cousin and I went out in the snow under the moon to play hide and seek in the orchard of all places. About 15 of us charged out there, deep into the orchard. And who gets the freaking short straw to seek first? But me. So I waited and counted about two minutes and then set off. It was really spooky, but I was excited. All the trees looked dark and knobby. The light of the moon was nearly gone under the branches. Anyways, Instead of zigzagging around, I went straight through and found myself on the far side of the orchard, almost in the open. I turned to go back in when I heard a voice say, Over here. I laughed and said, <laughs> Nikki? There was only an old building there, no house, and really nothing to see, so I was confused. The voice was high and clear, like a young girl's, and it said, Over here, come closer. I took a few hesitant steps forward, then fear washed over me, and I just bolted back into the orchard calling for my cousins. Everyone came out all concerned, and they must have seen how scared I was, because everyone got scared, and we all fled back to my aunt's house where I again was branded the one who reads. In the daylight, I went back thinking there must have been a house or windows and I was hearing a TV or something. Nope, just a building, not a scary one, 
but there was nothing there, and nowhere I could have been hearing the voice in front of me coaxing me closer. About eight years ago, we went to a friend's condo in the city. They were a bit of an odd couple, but very nice and brilliant. The guy wanted us to borrow this book on spiritual nature that he said was totally good. I don't like things like that, so I flipped through the book and something felt off. So I told my husband I didn't want us to take it. We said thanks, but no thanks, and left without it. About three months later, we needed to use our spare tire and lifted up the floorboard, covering it in the trunk section of our SUV. There was the book. Oh, hell no. I've heard and never believed of stories of books that wouldn't be gotten rid of. So we threw it in the trash, and I was fully ready to burn that crap if it popped up again. Thankfully, it seemed to stay trashed. My husband was really freaked out and pissed about that. It was easily the most unexplainable thing that happened to me personally. Most of this all happened so long ago, I've forgotten a lot of the finer details, but it was all in all a very strong argument that there are unexplained things out there in the world. So, to give you a little bit of background information on this story, which is 100% true, by the way, I would like to start with the fact that I am European. I posted a story a couple months back about something that happened to me in Tuscany, Italy. As for me and my friends in this story, we are from Spain, and when this happened, at the end of September 2023, we were fairly new to the USA. I moved here a while back for law school, and so did my friends. We had been living here for a few months and decided to explore the nature of this beautiful continent, as we all live in New York City. So, long story short, we decided to go on a road trip to Canada, drive around Lake Ontario and then back to New York City through upstate New York. I am a male and my friends were three females. For the sake of anonymity, let's call them Lisa, Anna, and Charlotte. Everything went super smooth until the last night. So, for our last night, we had rented an off-grid cabin in a remote area in the woods in upstate New York. To give some locals an idea, we were like half an hour drive from Harrisburg, I think. Me and Lisa had decided to spend one night in this cabin because it was one with nature. The cabin was super old, made from logwood, and there was no running water or electricity. Both me and Lisa had experience with survival in the wild in Europe. I, for myself, had been a Boy Scout my entire life, and even as a Scout leader for a while. Our other two friends were... Uh, as much as I love them, purebred city girls. They had pretty much zero experience with camping or to just be in a place where there is no service for their phones, as was the case in this cabin. We had been driving all day to get there, and when we reached the beginning of the forest, it was already past 10 p.m., and it was really dark that night. While driving to this place, we lost internet connection with the GPS, and so I had to drive to the cabin on intuition, paired with a good old-fashioned map, hoping for the best while trying to drive safe on these muddy trails. It was also rainy the entire day. On the way there, Anna and Charlotte were in the back of the car, And the moment they lost phone service, they got pretty uneasy for the rest of the ride. All of a sudden, in the pitch black darkness of the forest, we saw a campfire. But there were no houses around it or people, just a campfire. A well-organized one, since the fire was not spreading and it was not as big as a bonfire. 
It kind of startled all of us, as this was a little bit weird since there was no one around and we were really deep in the forest already. Plus, it was getting very late. When this happened, we also reached the end of the trail, and we figured we can take the wrong trail at a crossroads before. So, I turned around and we were on our way again. Half an hour later, and a couple of wrong trails later, we finally had arrived at our destination, as we could finally see the first glimpse of this godforsaken cabin in the middle of nowhere. To give you an idea how old it was, the potty, or the outhouse, was made out of wood, and it was outside the cabin. When we arrived, it was still raining, and both Anna and Lisa were definitely not in the mood for getting out of the car and get in a cabin with zero light. So, me and Lisa left the lights of the car on and went inside the cabin, while also using our phone flashlights to check the cabin out and see if we could find any old flashlights, which we did, and to see if we could turn on a fireplace which we didn't because all the wood was still wet from the rain, and it seemed no one had prepared dry wood anywhere. So, with a couple of old flashlights and a small improvised fire, I managed to make it a stove. We all four got in the cabin and started to make some pasta for us. Meanwhile, the girls were preparing the beds and closing the windows since it was already cold in this part of the state. The cabin had a small ladder which led to an elevated room and space with a bed where all three of the girls could fit in. And I would sleep downstairs in a bunk bed that seemed older than the First World War. While making pasta, Anna, one of the city girls, came up to me and knowing that both Lisa and Charlotte did not like to hear anything scary at night, told me that she had seen an old cemetery in the middle of the forest on the way to her cabin, and that she had seen a figure walk around there. I first laughed it off as nothing, as I mentioned in my previous story. I do not consider myself a big believer of scary stuff. Being from Spain, we take promises very seriously. To swear on God is very serious for us and she swore to God that she was not lying. I told her then that I believed her, but that there was no need to panic as I would lock all the doors when we would go to sleep. We had some pasta, managed to make a couple s'mores, which are lovely by the way, and drink a couple beers, or at least I did. They all just had one. I can assure you that I am not drunk after a couple of beers, and that I would never start to hallucinate. Just saying in case anyone thinks I saw stuff because of the beer. They all three went to sleep pretty early after finishing the s'mores and their beer, and I, considering that I really love the outdoors and that I don't really mind a little bit of rain, decided to take my last beer and a flashlight out to the front porch also very old and made of wood, and sat myself down with my beer while enjoying the sound of rain and the lovely sight of not seeing a single light in the distance. I could greatly appreciate this coming from New York City, and I just scanned the area around with my flashlight. There was nothing much really to see besides a lot of trees and a small creek a little further away. All I could hear was the wind, the rain, and the running water down into the creek. That was until I suddenly heard what I would describe as a weird roar. The first thing that came to my mind was a bear, but I had researched well before our trip and I knew bears were not common at all in this part of the state. I also know what a wild bear roar would sound like and it did not resemble a lot, except from the fact that it was a deep roar, if you get what I mean. Startled, both not really scared, I continued to scan the rest of the forest, 
for as far as I could see from the porch. It was then when my eye caught the glimpse of a figure, well hidden deep in the tree line. I would describe the figure as tall. As a reference, I am 6'4", and I thought this thing was at least a foot or two taller than me. It was well hidden because with its brown fur, that is what I think it was at least, or the skin of any case, blended in well with the trees in autumn. It was definitely aware of our presence as I saw two eyes glimpsing into my flashlight. I could not tell you what it was, but I swear to God, that was not a bear. It was bipedal and had rather long arms, I would say. We looked at each other for what seemed like an eternity, but in reality, it was more like five seconds before it vanished behind a tree, and I heard another roar. It was then when I felt all of my hair stand up, and I was definitely very much scared. I went inside as quick as I could and locked all the doors and closed all the curtains. I quickly went to bed and tried to wave it off as just my exhaustion of driving all day, playing tricks on my mind. But I promise you, this was very real. After an hour or so, I had calmed down and I finally fell asleep. The rest of the night was uneventful, and the next morning, when I went to relieve myself after having drank all that beer the night before, the weather had cleared and it was rather sunny, and as far as I could see, the forest was calm and beautiful. No sight of any animals or anything abnormal. We had a nice breakfast that morning and left for our way out to the big city that never sleeps. And so ends also my story of that night. I never talked about that, and I never talked about what I saw that night, because I knew all three girls did not like to hear scary stories. And I figure after three months that this was the best place to share it. If anyone has any idea of what it could have been, please feel free to enlighten me, especially if it is backed up with rational reasoning. Thank you for listening to my story. I've been backpacking and camping mostly solo as an adult for the majority of my life. I'm cautious about my surroundings and I listen carefully when I'm out. I try to remain an observer and move through the land with little impact. I'm also very interested in the mysterious and obscure, cryptids, alternate realities, and the unexplained. I've read most of the missing 411 cases. I think Polly is experiencing some confirmation bias and am a serious devotee of true crime. All of the morbid and curious things I can find. Anything strange that will fire the imagination. There have been occasions where I've slightly felt uncomfortable or watched even when I've been out in the woods, but mostly I've chalked it up to being alone and alert. Maybe my inherent skepticism makes me less susceptible to encounters, which others experience. I look for logical conclusions first. I've never encountered in truly off or deranged people out in the forest, but I do consider that the biggest threat, the human animal. A few years ago, I set out to camp near an old growth forest in North Georgia. Most old growth here is gone, but there are places that haven't been logged and if you get the chance to visit one, Wherever you may live, I'd suggest it. It's beautiful, serene and alive in a way that's hard to describe. This particular forest was one of the hemlock and popular, and the trees were massive. I had a guidebook that gave directions out into the sticks following little country roads that eventually turned into gravel. 
After a long drive into a national forest, I parked near the trail, which was unmaintained, meaning it wasn't very popular or highly traveled. I hiked out through the woods to where the trail eventually just kind of stopped. There was very little undergrowth. I spent the afternoon just exploring, looking at the trees and enjoying the calm. I eventually made my way down to a creek and crossed over it into an old field that formed a sort of like bowl in the land with hills and ridges on all sides. The fact that there was a field means that there had, I guess, at one point been people living in that area, but I saw nothing of the sort when I was there, and my map showed that I should have been far from any roads or settlements. I set up my tent and made some food. It was late when I decided to have a little smoke and lay out in the field in front of my tent and look at the stars before bed. There was little to no light pollution, and I always relish the opportunity to enjoy the skies at times like those. As I was laying there, I began hearing a loud knocking sound from up near the ridge where I'd been earlier in the day, maybe a thousand yards away. Three knocks and a long pause, followed by three more, and then it would repeat. When I say knocks, what I mean is a very loud noise, like two logs or trees being hit together, loud enough to reverberate in a little bowl I was in, loud enough you could almost feel it. I could pinpoint where the sound was coming from, but it was night in the forest, and anyone who's been out there knows that it's dark. I thought it had been a person making the noise because... What else could make such a rhythmic sound? It was extremely loud and would have taken considerable effort to produce. I'd seen no one else at all during the day, and the direction from which the sound came was the section of old growth I'd explored earlier. And that's it. Eventually, the sound stopped, and I went to bed feeling like I had heard something I wasn't meant to hear. Or maybe that I'd heard something specifically meant for me and me alone to hear. I packed up and hiked out the next day. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't hyper aware and waiting for something else to happen. But nothing did. I told close friends about this and they'll either say it was for sure a Sasquatch or that I was for sure close to someone's house that I didn't know about. But why would a person be out in the woods late at night banging logs together in the dark? And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true backwood creepy stories. I'd like to take a moment and acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita V, Nat Davies, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Tammy Slayton, Colt Stonewolf, Les Crispin, Samantha Place, Patty's niece, Denise S, Call Me Carter, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all for your continued support, for without you, this channel would not exist. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. In the meantime, please stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good night. Peace, love, and light to you all.